Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Alexa and Friends. My name is Jeff Blankenberg, and today I get the opportunity to chat with Yang Lu, who's a principal scientist on the Alexa AI team. Uh, so every once in a while, we get some great guests from our Amazon Science Organization. And today is this no... This answer your question. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa. Wow. Uh, and today is no exception. I am so excited to have you here, Yang. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I like to do, and I know you've been uh, warned about this, is that I like to ask a few silly questions at the beginning of these interviews to give people a little idea about who you are and, and maybe some perspectives you have on things. So the first question that I like to ask, and uh, for anyone that may watch future episodes of this, I do have intentions to switch this up and change the questions. But for today, these might seem familiar. So the first question is, uh, we've had lots and lots of superhero movies and comic book characters uh are very very popular these days so i'm curious if you could pick a superhero power for yourself what do you think you might pick um actually i was walking through while watching some of your episodes before and i was thinking um when my kids sometimes play this well you can have a wish and what's your wish with the game when one of them often said can I wish for more wishes? <laughs> so my first <laughs> reaction is, can I use my superpower to have more superpowers, whatever, oh, super yeah. strength, or supervision, those kinds of things. But that's just yeah. joking. Uh, I, I know I can only have one. <laughs> and course, if I can be great, though, maybe, like maybe two for now. Uh, the first one, I, I really hope I can have the superpower to stop the pandemic uh, right now. Oh, and yeah. maybe that's one for everybody, not just for me. Um, and the other one is the real one. Um, that's probably more related to what we're going to talk about today. Um, I often hope um, I can have a superpower to kind of uh, formulate more my thoughts into a good language, a good way to express to different audience. Like when I was talking to you about some technical stuff, that's probably um, a different way from talking to my colleague about the uh, same sure. content. And same thing when I talk, <laughs> when I was talking to my kids, when sometimes I hope, oh, I should use the language that's good for them. Um, yeah, so like formulating those random thoughts or talking points into what um, good way. That's interesting. That's what I, I, I like that. The way the way that that occurs to me is it feels like language language based empathy. Right, you are you're able to recognize and identify the best way to explain something or, or communicate with someone, um, and then be naturally able to do that in whatever words or language, even potentially, uh, yeah. that would best be suited for. I love that. That's uh, a, yeah. I, I like that. And so that's an easy one to talk about how you would use it for good. That's something else that I like to focus on with these superpower questions. Yeah. Most superpowers, somebody wants to have super strength or speed or flight or something. Yeah, and that's very natural. <laughs> It's it's very easy to understand how you might use those for evil, um, but I always like to ask how you use it for good. But this one's pretty clear. Uh, um, being, being this one, I guess, share your use knowledge it for evil. Or they even um, um, factor in incorrect the information, and then you will not do any good, right? Whether you can use what this kind of thing. Maybe we'll talk more more about this. Whether when you talk about these chatbots and over the language generation techniques, what they talk. Yeah. Agreed, man. Uh, this is a this is a good one. I really like that. Uh, all right, my second question. I have to tell you a little story first, uh, and then I need you to make a choice. So, uh, I want you to imagine you're walking through a large city, uh, and you need to get one block over. And one large city block can take a while to walk all the way around. And so you note on your way that there's an alley that leads directly where you'd like to go. Uh, it's a bright sunny day. There's nothing to suggest that there would be any trouble going down this alley. So you you walk down the alley towards your destination. Uh, and as you get about halfway down, you notice that a large horse-sized chicken, uh, horse-sized duck, I'm sorry, why did I say chicken? <laughs> duck, uh, emerges at the end that you're heading towards. It's a very, very large duck about the size of a horse. Um, and as would be natural, you say, I'm not going that way. That looks insane. I'm going to turn around and go the other way, uh, take the longer route, only to find out that that end has been closed by 100 duck-sized horses, tiny horses. Now, you're probably going to be in some sort of scuffle or fight as you go through this, but I'd love to know which direction you would go and why you think you might have a better success going that direction. 
do they do they look cute or aggressive? <laughs> well, I guess they're, right? they're more on the aggressive side than they are on the okay, cute. Okay, yeah, yeah. Then that's different from whether playing with cute animals. Um, I don't know. I guess my decision probably will be whether based on my instinct at that, that particular moment. But now if I can do more logical thinking, I think I will go with the one horse size, the other dog. Um, right. I one. just feel as whether you have a hundred uh, uh, duck says the horses, they, they, they form, they can join forces, they form like an army, then it's kind of hard to uh, fight with those. So I I'll like go that. with one. And the horse size seems doable, manageable. <laughs> I, have, I have to say, I've, I've asked this question of more than two dozen people at this point. And you were the first person to suggest that the small horses could team up, uh, <laughs> like, would, would like fight in unison, right? Where they're actually working together. It, yeah. Um, first person to suggest that. And I think you're right. I think that, like, if we have a world where there are tiny horses, what's to say that they couldn't also uh, be communicating and form an yeah. attack? Yeah, uh, definitely. Brilliant. But they will brilliant. use their language. Maybe I can express my thoughts. Well, let me go through, and then they will hear what they in their uh, language, and then they can then. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's nice that you brought your superpower into this because it doesn't just apply to humans. Uh, it would be nice to be able to tell my dog exactly what I need her to do. Yeah, uh, get her to contribute around the house a little bit instead of just leaving her toys everywhere, right? That would be great. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that, that was fantastic. Thanks for the fun there at the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. The next thing that I like to do, and this is one of our audience's favorite parts, is to kind of understand where you came from and, and how you got to where you are today. So I mentioned that you're a principal scientist on the Alexa AI team, uh, and we'll get into that more a bit later. Yes, but what I'd like to know initially is, kind of what your origin story is to go back to the superhero kind of stories. Where did you come from? Where did you go to school? Where did you grow up? Um, I, I'd love the long version of kind of where you, where you started and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, we can, we can do the long version. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of things when now looking back, it seems they happen naturally. What I didn't do very what well, deliberate and what thinking decision, but we can go through the story. Maybe they are not so interesting. Um, so I grew up in China uh, and then went to uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. Um, back then, when you went to uh, university, then you need to choose a major. Well, same thing, now you still need to choose a major. Um, so I majored in electrical engineering. Uh, that's kind of my parents' decision. Um, and I still remember when I um, was deciding, should I do computer science, should I do electrical engineering, or even whether medical, or the lawyer, all those things. Uh, uh, between electrical engineering and computer science, uh, my dad felt um, you don't really want to major in computer science. Computer is just a tool you use in your whatever work, um, but you don't do it for a career. Um, so he thought what well, I should major in electrical engineering. You do what a circuit, a signal, those kinds of things, and you can still use computer. Uh, now, it might be the other way around. Then. People choose about computer science and then um, they learn all these computer skills and then they can go to different industry because everywhere you need a computer, you need software yeah. or any kind yeah, of thing. That's, that's uh, something I say yeah. frequently is that, uh, you know, I, I have a daughter that's 17. She's looking to enter college here soon. Uh, and I told her, like, there will never be a shortage of software developers. Right. Early. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's every, different. But back then, as I said, right. my dad thought, well, no, you should have just what work on computer. Well, the computer is just the assistant or tool you use. Um, right. So I went to what Tsinghua and I studied in uh, electrical engineering. And then in that department, uh, um, we have like over 200 students in the school. They kind of assign you to different classes. You have, what, a 30 or 40-ish students in one class. And then all of these classes, they have different focused areas. Like one, one um, class is more about signal processing, and the other one is more about circuit, or the other one like microwave or image, all those what are different focused subfields or areas. Uh, and then for my class with assignment, kind of. Um, um, most of the professors we work with, they work on signal processing, pattern recognition, um, communication. Um, so that's kind of how I started with this area. And then in the final year, we needed to do an uh, undergraduate thesis. And because of that class I was in, I started working with professors in the recognition lab. Um, the undergraduate thesis topic for me was um, 
Chinese word segmentation. Um, I don't know if you know the language or Chinese. We write uh, without any space. It's just a sequence of characters. And then if you want to do any kind of language processing or even speech recognition, uh, you need to have this unit like word. Uh, in English, you have space. That's a very well, good delimiter. You can get the words. When in Chinese, it's just a sequence of characters. You have these 10, 20 characters. You need to find the words. Uh, so say, for example, you have character A, B, C, D. You may segment it into A, B followed by C, D, um, two words. Or it may be A, B, C as a word, and then D as another word. Uh, so that's my thesis on the topic. It's still a um, language processing task right now. Uh, back then, um, the approach we used is let's do a dictionary-based approach. And we will look up what in the dictionary and see, do I see word A, B, C, or do I see the word A, B? Uh, and then you can use a greedy approach. You can go with the longest word you can find. A, B, C is the longest, so let's do that one. And then if D is not a word, you can go back and you can change your decision. Let's do A, B followed by C, D. Um, so that's a very well, a simple approach. And then we also added like a, a probability, what makes the most sense, and uh, what's a reasonable segmentation for that context. Um, anyway, so that's how I started. I started doing this kind of language processing um, and then the model we use, that uh, once you get the words out, uh, you can train this thing called language model. A language model tells you the probability of a word following some history or following uh, And that's in, in speech recognition. Uh, so after I finished my undergraduate uh, thesis, um, and as I said, what everything just happened naturally, um, because we all had kind of had good grades, and then you just naturally started, continued with master degree. Uh, so I continued in that same speech recognition lab, and I was working on all these speech recognition and language, problem, language modeling uh, problem. Everything was for uh, speech recognition. And I still remember uh, when we were doing uh, master re research or thesis, and we worked with this company, Philips. Uh, right now, it's a very different company or different in the world, um, but that's for building a large vocabulary speech recognition uh, system. And often the time we just uh, sit in front of the computer and you say something that's very long and you look at the uh, transcription if the computer is recognizing it correctly. I still remember all those demos, that vision image is still here. Um, yeah, so that's uh, undergraduate and the master. I worked on all these what well, speech recognition language processing problems. And then after I got my master, again, uh, it's just a natural decision. Everyone came to US to pursue or well, even advance the degree. So I came to US for PhD. Uh, and then for my PhD dissertation, um, I worked uh, um, in this place called International Computer Science Institute, uh, ICSI, in Berkeley. Um, the topic is uh, supported by DARPA project, uh, uh, and the program was called EARS. Um, this is for something called a rich transcription of speech. Uh, so you probably know in speech recognition, you have the audio, you have the speech, and you need to get the words out. This is speech recognition. Uh, but for that program, in addition to getting the correct words, uh, we want to generate the so-called rich information. Uh, you need to know who is talking. This is speaker A says something, this is speaker B who said something else. And we also want to find a sentence boundary. When you talk, you don't say period. Uh, comma, uh, explanation mark, everything is kind of what a hidden implicit. Uh, but for uh, downstream components to understand the speech recognition out of it, it's better to have like punctuation as if things looks like a written language, it's much easier. Uh, so we worked on these problems, identifying sentence boundary and also disfluencies uh, in spontaneous speech if people repeat uh, themselves, the people correct themselves, the people say these, um, ah, uh, um, I know you, but uh, you know, uh, um, um, uh, like what I'm doing right now. Uh, so we want to find all of these things and clean it up and everything will be easy for the subsequent language processing component. And this is called rich transcription. Uh, nice. so that's my thesis topic. Sorry to interrupt. Does rich, uh, yes. does rich transcription also include things like, um, Sentiment analysis and, and emotion detection? Not really, not really. Whether well, that's still focusing on just uh, the surface form, getting the speech and putting punctuation, get the um, additional like differences I mentioned and the speaker information. So that, was, was that was what the program was about. 
Got it. Because I know we have things uh, specifically with Alexa that offer, for example, speaker recognition, right? Who, yeah. who is the person talking? Was any of your research part of where we, I know that was early on in, in your PhD years, but um, was, uh, was, was any of that a basis for some of the work that we've done to enable I, I, I think so. Well, that's not my work, but we have what well, we have colleagues we who also work there in this what well, our ES program and that problem you mentioned the speaker recognition um it's called a speaker diarization uh, when you have a multi-party meeting then you need to know who spoke and when um and the approach they develop right now is already 15 what almost 15, 17 what, years ago, uh, it was the basis for a lot of the things uh, we are using now, not just we and also the entire community. Uh, and one of my kind of a mentor or um, co-advisors for my um, PhD thesis um, back then in Berkeley, ICSI, with, um, his name is Andres Stokey, and right now he also works at um, Alexa, and he is doing all these with uh, speech recognition and speaker um, diarization, problem. Very, very cool. Uh, and so uh, you've, you've obviously had a rich history in, uh, in voice and speech. Um, how, how long have you been at Amazon at Alexa? Uh, two years. So we can continue that trend <laughs> oh, after I got my what, a PhD. And again, I just feel it's what a natural. I want to continue with the research. And I just started my academic career. Um, I went to what, the University of Texas at Dallas as a faculty member. Uh, so I supervised the students uh, there. And we worked on a variety of speech and language related problems, like speech recognition, modeling, prosody, prosody means. Uh, how you talk, not just the what you say, how you say things. Uh, right. And then like summarization, sentiment analysis, you mentioned um, a variety of, um, of problems and we probably can touch on some of those problems later. Yeah. Uh, so that's the um, kind of being in academia, working with students and postdoc and working on all of these kind of scientifically interesting weather uh, problems. And then after many years uh, being there, because kind of what uh, family reasons, I moved to California and I switched from academia to industry. Uh, and being in the industry, I started seeing the other side of research. It's not just for the sake of doing research or even uh, publication. Um, um, it's mostly for products and you want to develop things and that will be used by millions billions of uh users so right. that's that's another what uh interesting aspect of all of these um speech and the language technology and i worked on um, um different problems in a couple of different companies and as you said i joined um amazon almost two years ago yeah and, and you're, you're being modest about those other companies you've worked for right <laughs> i mean you, you've done time with google you've done time with facebook yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think those kinds of things are, are really interesting to share because it it shows that the the scientific community is a big part of a lot of the work that all of Indeed. us are involved with and doing. And yeah. I would imagine uh, as a researcher, it's got to be really interesting to be able to take the work that you've done, the research that you've done, and now figure out ways to scale that to millions and billions of people. Uh, because it's, it, that's a whole different animal than just a small subset of a thousand or a hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. So that the horse size or duck size thing, whether right. maybe applicable here. Yeah, when you try to uh, scale things that can be used by all of these what well, um millions, millions of users, and also with some latency constraint, it's a very different problem from writing papers. I just get ten percent uh, improvement in some um, accuracy, um, and that um, uh, you mentioned what a different company. So when I was at Facebook and we were working on these natural language processing problems. Um, originally, like when, um, I don't know if you use Facebook, but when you see those recommended uh, posts, uh, often the time they use a lot of like social network information. Your friends whether, um, have already seen this and you probably can um, look at this post or what are some videos. Uh, but our focus was trying to look at the content uh, of that post. Is this more interesting and relevant to your interest? Um, so we were doing some language processing, finding entities, and see if this is something that's interesting to that uh, user based on um, his profile or the interest and the past browsing um, history. Um, yeah. So that's a good use of all of these like NLP yeah. techniques. And you have you just have an incredible history. This is you know twenty five years of speech and language. It's amazing. 
Yeah. Uh, oh. So congratulations on that. And and speaking of congratulations, I heard that you were recently uh, named on the International Speech Communication Association, uh, ISCA, um, for 2021. That's that's amazing. Um, yeah, I guess um, I can only say I'm humbled. I'm honored to get that uh, rec uh, recognition. Um, so uh, ISCA, well, that's Community for Speech Communication, International Speech Communication Association, and they do all kinds of research related to speech communication, and that covers uh, phonetics, like phonemes, what the sounds, these kinds of things, and also linguistic information about the language um, itself. Of course, the main part is about uh, computers. What well, if you want to develop all these what well, the systems that need to um, recognize speech, understand speech, and recognize a speaker? Um, so all these things are covered in this community. And there are also other aspects related to even like medical hearing aids and uh, speech language or pathology disorders, all of those things are uh, uh, part of the um, research topics in ISCA. Uh, and similar to many other scientific communities, they have this fellow program that kind of recognize people uh, who have contributed significantly to the community. Um, and every year they recognize a different number of people. This year, I remember, I think it's eight people that were selected to be um, fellow of ISCA. And for me, my contribution is similar to what I was telling you, what I've been doing, uh, speech recognition, understanding, processing, modeling, summarization, um, NLP research in general. Right, and, and calling back to your college degree, the, the degree your dad recommended you get, electrical engineering, uh, this isn't your first uh, kind of recognition either, right? I mean, you're also a fellow in the IEEE? Yeah, that happened, I guess, um, several months before. Uh, and if I may, well, um, I don't know, I doubt whether anyone I know is in the audience right now. I, I really want to express my gratitude to all of the people I've worked with, starting with those um, people who introduced me to the field, like the people I worked with when I was undergraduate students, so, professors in that speech recognition lab. And then all the way in the past uh, 20, 25 uh, years, all my advisors, mentors, students, postdocs, and colleagues, um, even family and the friends, uh, it's like Oscar speech. <laughs> but, uh, I have that feeling now. Uh, and then related to these what, um, fellows, I think I often have this, um, what is called imposter syndrome. Um, yes. And that also maybe because I'm one of those minorities, female, and this is a problem people talk um, a lot recently. And you said that you have uh, a daughter. Um, I'm hoping when the next generation, when um, people look at uh, these different science community, and then look at the, uh, all the fellows or other uh, people, they list on the website, and they will see people who are like them, and they will have less and less the feeling I have. Um, I hope yeah. that's I going to be a good thing for the community. Um, I, I know it, it's rampant in the in the technology and science communities, the idea of imposter syndrome. Uh, I, I think it's good. I um, While I don't enjoy the feeling that I get, uh, <laughs> I, I think it, it's a healthy perspective. Because the opposite, uh, I've actually given talks on this, uh, is something called Dunning-Kruger syndrome. Have you heard uh, of that? Not really. Uh, <laughs> I guess I don't have that. <laughs> sure. No, you, you don't at all. Th those are the people that believe that they are amazing and did all of the things oh, okay. themselves, yeah, but are I actually wrong. Right? So imposter syndrome is when you're actually pretty good at something, but you don't believe it. Uh, yeah. And Dunning-Kruger is the opposite of that. It's where you believe you're very, very good and you're not. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think imposter syndrome is okay and it's healthy. Uh, and I don't think that we'll ever get beyond that because everybody presents their, their best world, right? I mean, it, I was going to transition into, um, you know, the research papers that you published. You've, you've got quite a prolific publication history, uh, and some of the people in the chat have actually commented on that as well. Um, and it's it's just interesting to see if people look across the, the landscape. I'm sure they look at your work and go, uh, she's amazing, unbelievable, all the work that she's done, all the things she's contributed to, and you sit back and say, I wish I'd done more. Yeah, right? like, yeah. that's a different feeling. It's kind of a self with <laughs> appreciation. <laughs> Uh, but I, I am very glad I have all those what I meant to, they are super, super supportive. And some of the people you even talk to, whether in this program, Julia Hirschberg or Dilek Wadahkuru and tour, and yeah, they, they, they were supportive yeah. all of my career development in the past. And 
Yeah. Right. I, um, None of us got here by ourselves, right? That's what I always say. Uh, yes. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. I'm also saying whether we should all pay it forward. And I'm also doing things I can to help what are the next um, right. um, everyone. So speaking of papers, let's get into one specifically. I know you just had, uh, you're one of the authors accepted for a paper inter inner speech. Um, and I'll let you talk about it, but it's, it's leveraging ASR uh, for deep entity retrieval. Can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is related to both speech recognition and the downstream processing. Uh, so this is an entity retrieval task. And I know many people use um, some sort of assistance, whether it's Siri, Alexa, uh, Google. Uh, often the time, if there's an entity in that user utterance, it may not be correctly recognized, especially if it's a rare entity. You are trying to search for a local restaurant, and uh, these assistants haven't heard of it. You are checking weather for some what, city, but not very populated weather city. Uh, so, if the entity is not correctly recognized, it's very hard for these assistants to take action because they need to look at the database or the catalog and see, oh, this is the one you're referring to, and I'm going to take some action, whether it's uh, returning the information about that restaurant or play the music or the song whether uh, the user is asking. So what do we do when that entity is not correctly recognized? You cannot retrieve the correct entity. Uh, and in this particular paper, um, we look at it. Can we use multiple recognition output? Because a uh, speech recognition system called ASR. Uh, it doesn't just return the one best hypothesis. It can also give you multiple candidates. Uh, this is a very old technique. Uh, like I said, whether even when we work on problems 10 or 20 years ago, everyone was looking at multiple candidates from um, ASR system. But here, now we are in this deep learning what error, and we you, we were trying to use a new technique to look at the old uh, problem. Uh, so we use all these neural network methods um, and then explore the different ways to represent uh, n best hypothesis from speech recognition system. And we use all these techniques called what, uh, attention deep neural network uh, to determine what, what is the best representation for those and best hypothesis. Um, and our results do show when you use multiple candidates from ASR, then you get much better results than just relying on the top one hypothesis. Um, yeah. yeah, I think so that's, it's, that's not right. surprising. I mean, as you think about no, it, that doesn't seem like it's a, it's surprising, but it is it is certainly interesting to think about that we're we're doing additional work that the user at the end of the day may never see. Yeah. Uh, but we're saying, hey, they said this, but it could be one of these five best things, um, and then we work through that process uh, using natural language understanding and a number of other tools mm -hmm. to understand what what is the the actual best out of these. Right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is a problem that's very typical for these kind of pipeline system. You have speech recognition, you have some understanding components uh, afterwards. And if the first uh, components doesn't provide the right hypothesis or prediction, the second one is going to suffer and the error is going to propagate to the next component. What do you do? And you can ask the, the upstream or that component for more information, and then you do your resolution retrieval, any kind of understanding uh, in this second subsequent um, components, and you will do a better job because you have other information available, like catalog, um, even some user related information. Got it. Uh, and then related to this problem, we're talking about uh, how ASR errors may affect some downstream understanding task. And if I may, I just want to advertise whether something we uh, also doing so our team, especially with a scientist, uh, uh, So Kwon Kim, he's the main driver uh, for this challenge we are organizing. This is uh, one of the tracks in this year's dialogue system technology challenge, DSTC challenge. Um, we are trying to um, evaluate of the conversation modeling or the dialogue system performance using speech interactions. Uh, a lot of the research on dialogue recently has focused on text-based conversations. And we know when you use dialogue systems, often it is speech-based interaction and uh, speech recognition errors have a negative impact there. So we want to see whether in real scenarios, what is the performance of all of these dialogue systems or conversation modeling uh, technology. And we're organizing this uh, DSDC challenge and I hope there will be many 
participate, uh, participating system, and then we can see what, um, how we can advance the technology. Yeah, that's that's excellent. I actually just shared a, a link to that directly with our audience. So uh, hopefully we'll have a few people check out that challenge. That's very, very interesting. Um, speaking of papers, another topic that you've been covering lately is common sense inference for smooth and effective communication. Um, can you can you help me understand kind of what that means? Yeah, it's a very hard problem. Uh, so we were just talking about uh, some very specific uh, task oriented the conversation, right? You want to check the weather, you want to play some music, and that's all task oriented the conversation. And this common sense related work is for open domain conversation. So this is like for our chatbot, uh, social bot. Um, recently, this is very big. Uh, there are a lot of research people in the science community. And you probably have seen some announcement from uh, different companies. Google has a chatbot called Mina, Facebook has one called Blenderbot, and Baidu has one called uh, Plato. Uh, everyone is investing um, in this area, using all these large pre-trained models to build the open domain conversation or dialogue systems. Uh, but the technology is not ready yet. And there are a lot of problems in these neural generation approaches. The system may not be consistent with itself. Um, it says something in one turn and in the next turn, and you'll see a contradiction there. It may repeat the information it has just said in the previous turn. It may give you something that's not factually correct. Uh, and you were talking about empathy. The system doesn't show whether the correct empathy when you are sad and they still says, oh, blah, 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 it's very excited tone. Uh, so to address these problems uh, in the research community, often the time people, um, because we're using all these machine learning models, so they start trying um, to get appropriate data to train models to address those specific problems I mentioned, um, whether it's factual correctness or uh, empathy or consistency problem. But there's one aspect that hasn't been studied um, a bit for this open domain conversation that is common sense. Um, so I can give you an example. If I tell my friend, oh, I'm going to have a, a live interview tomorrow with Jeff and this Alexa and the friends um, thing, um, his or her reaction may be, uh, but don't worry, you will you will do what very well because yeah. my person probably knows I'm going to get nervous because it's not a live event. Um, so this kind of implicit uh, common sense reasoning um, is not very well modeled in the current uh, neural network um, based approach. And that's what we were trying to do. Uh, yeah, so how do we do this? Uh, it's it's very interesting to approach that because it, we, we call it common sense as if all humans should just know that this is something that's natural and obvious. Yeah. That's uh, why it's about the common sense. And right. these things are implicit. It doesn't say, oh, I think you are nervous. And I'm going to say, oh, don't worry. Then you will do just the other well. Um, how do we get that implicit part? And how can we get a appropriate data sets or corpora to train all these models? So that's how we would have started. And we thought, oh, we need a data set to do this kind of thing. Where do we get this kind of what, social related uh, reactions or conversation or dialogues? Uh, so we started with something called social IQA. And from the name, you may be able to tell it's related to social events. Um, that's a data set collected by what are some folks at uh, LNAI and other um, places. Um, I can give you a scenario or example in that data set. Um, um, example says, Alex or Jeff spill the water, spaghetti or food on the floor. What is this person going to do? Uh, and there are multiple uh, choices there. This person is going to mop up or clean the floor. And this person is going to eat the food. This person is going to run around and play in the mess. So we want to see whether um, um, when this data set was developed, it's meant to see if machines can do this kind of common sense reading and handle some um, social events. And, and we thought, oh, that seems a good um, starting point for us to collect the related conversation or dialogue. So we use those scenarios or context in social IQA data set, and we ask the crowd workers to write a conversation about that. Oh, I spilled the food. And then your friends may say, oh, let's clean it up. Your friends may say, oh, no food and let's all the pizza. So these are all like natural re uh, reaction. And they kind of capture this kind of common sense whether uh, we're talking about. Um, and we collected this data set. And right now it's in the final processing. We do want to release to the entire research community. It should be out but, um, pretty soon. Uh, and in that paper, we look at it. Um, 
using these neural methods, trained using the data set we collected, and also some other existing data sets, and we showed what good performance when you use these uh, more like a common sense related um, conversation or dialogue. Um, yeah. Very cool. So our, our audience has already mentioned one of these, um, but the, the question I want to ask you next is about the, the hard challenges. What are the really big problems that you're facing as you get into this? And so in the dialogue system space, what, what are the big problems? The, the one that was mentioned in the chat was the idea of sarcasm. Uh, I know that that's a very big challenge. In, in that, uh, that is. But when, uh, when you think about your big challenges that you face, what are the things that stand out to you? Um, yeah, so it's not one challenge. I do want to mention multiple challenges. And in those two papers, so we talk about the two different kinds of conversational dialogue system. One is task oriented. One, uh, we know right now all these um, assistants they do pretty well for a very specific task, of play music, or check weather, or even multi turn conversation. If you need to make a hotel. Um, restaurant the reservation with a few turns, the system can get the information they need and they can complete that transaction or um, finish the task. Uh, but that's that's all what the current system can do. Um, the conversation is quite rigid. You cannot go with all that predefined schema or intents and entity or slots. Um, so how do we scale up to different scales, to different tasks? How can we allow users to say things in a more natural way rather than just the completing uh, or providing the agents with the information the agent is asking? Uh, how can we train models using what well, less data? We don't want to collect the hundreds of whether well, or even thousands, millions of utterances for each of those tasks we are uh, doing. Uh, these are all challenges for that task oriented conversation. And then the other um, side of that spectrum is the one we were just talking about with this open domain conversation. If you want to have a chatbot that can talk to you about pretty much any topic, uh, there's no way you can write these predefined uh, prompts or responses for each of those topics. Right? We cannot even list all of the possible topics. So all of these uh, neural network-based approaches they are very promising. They, you don't have this constraint. You're only covering certain number of topics. Um, but as I was saying, the current technology is still far, far away from human performance, whether yeah. uh, from whether, whether getting I, a good reaction from the users. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. That sounds a lot like um, what we're going to talk about next, which is the Alexa Prize. Um, I mean, that that contest is kind of tailored around that open domain idea right where indeed uh, yeah the competitors um who i think the most recent winner was the the, the check uh technical, the check university. technical university yeah they just announced um, the um, winner but so I, I would imagine you probably have more to share on that but I, i'd love your perspective on the alexa prize and the competition and kind of the goals that are that are out there to to do that okay that's cool what well, just in case whether people don't know about this um alexa prize uh one of the kind of tracks in the Alexa Prize is the Social Vault Grand Challenge. This started a few years back, I think it's 2016. Um, Amazon or Alexa started this competition with the goal to help advance the field of conversation AI. Um, and then the task is for the university teams to build these so-called social vault or chat vaults uh, that interact with the real Alexa customers. If you have a device at chat, then you will be talking to these social bots developed by university teams. Uh, the ultimate goal for this Alexa Prize social bot competition is to get a score of four out of five uh, from judges. Uh, when you have these open domain conversations at the end, you can read uh, but how did the conversation go? And then you give a uh, kind of a subjective word, uh, score. Um, and the, in terms of the length, the goal is also to have a conversation with a minimum 20 minutes. This is very hard. And as yeah. I was telling you right now, all of the approaches we use, um, you see all those repetition, contradiction, incorrectness, all these things. So if you have a 20 minutes conversation, you get to see all those problems. It's very hard to have a four or five with a score out of what a five right. uh, if you have a long conversation. So, uh, so we haven't... Uh, yeah, Sorry. we haven't met that goal yet. And this is the end of the fourth competition. 
All right. You and Go I have ahead. been talking for almost 40 minutes. I wonder what the judges um, would think of this 40 minute conversation. <laughs> I think it's very natural. And because with what we were just doing, this kind of uh, turn taking back channel and then interruption, we still handle it very well, right? You were trying to say something, and I will see if I should yield the floor and let you talk. In the current weather, uh, that's, that's very hard. Um, um, right. Yeah, but there are uh, other problems. So I was just saying, we haven't met that goal yet. And this year's competition, this is the end of the fourth year. Uh, check with the university. This is the first place followed by Stanford University and University of um, Buffalo. Um, after four years, many, many university teams will attempt and we haven't met that goal. And that tells you this is indeed a very uh, challenging uh, problems. But we also see a lot of good progress from these university teams in the past years. They have been increasing the coverage of the topics the system can um, have a conversation with the university about. Um, the, uh, the conversations are getting more and more engaging. And especially this year, a lot of the university teams are exploring the neural network weather-based um, approaches for generation. Uh, so they don't need to write all of those rule-based or template-based responses for different domains. Um, so I'm hoping to see what a more advanced um, yeah. from all these teams. But I think that's how we grow, right? We have to do a lot of it manually first, and then we look at ways to kind of consolidate and grow those yeah. manual processes into yeah. machine learning operations. I, th yeah. I think that's it's natural yeah. to try to progress that way. And this this is yeah. uh, it's interesting to see that we're starting to pivot and turn towards a more neural yeah. approach. Uh -huh. And the good thing whether for these competition is uh, these university teams or the social boss, they are using Alexa customers to get they get the real data. This is very different from the research they do in a university lab uh, setting. Oh, I'm going to recruit 10 or 20 people, or maybe what a crowd worker, 100 or other people, and try the system I'm developing. So every day they get a lot of conversation, real conversations. And at the end, they get the uh, ratings from real users, and they also get some verbal, verbal feedback about the conversation. That's very useful for the university teams to um, improve or continue to develop their systems. Agreed. Um, and, and so this is a want... very good opportunity Amazon provided to the university. Yes. Uh, for any of you that want to try this, if, if you're not aware, you can talk to any Alexa device that you own. Uh, and I won't say uh, the name, but you can say let's chat. Yes. Uh, and yeah. that will randomly choose a chatbot for you. And you can try to have some of those conversations with these university projects. It's a really yeah. fun way to uh, yeah. try and have uh -huh. a long conversation with an uh, AI. Yeah. And there's also a new competition that has just started this year. So I was saying that's the track one in Alexa Prize. The new competition is a task board. This is different from the open domain conversation. The task board is meant to help customers to finish some task. And we're looking at what uh, two tasks. One is the home improvement, the DIY. I know a lot of people are probably interested in that. And the other one is cooking. If you want to bake a cake, and then you can ask Alexa to help you with those different steps. Uh, so this is the other competition. Uh, and right now, 10 university teams are participating uh, in this competition. And I remember the task force will be available to the customers later this year. I don't remember the exact date. Yeah, very so cool. it'll be very interesting to see this new um, competition. This is a uh, multimodal one, not like the first one. You have an echo show device, and you will see whether that image or video that tells you the steps you need to do for that DIY or cooking. That's exciting. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Uh, all right, we're, we're going to get back to more papers you've written, because you've written so many. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to ask about is um, a paper you recently co-authored about the growing popularity of virtual assistants. And uh, one of the things that's near and dear to me as an Alexa skill builder uh, is the idea of entity resolution. So can you go into more detail about what that paper entailed? Um, yeah, I can briefly mention it. So this is what a recent paper, as you said, it's about entity resolution. And this is for Alexa shopping application. Um, when you talk to Alexa, you can say, um, add milk to my shopping cart. What does milk mean when you say milk? You probably are thinking of, about a particular uh, brand or that milk maybe you ordered uh, last week. So we need to resolve that entity. We need to find a ranked list of, of the relevant entities. How do we do that? Uh, we have uh, users 
history information we can use based on the products you have already uh, purchased. We also have descriptions for different products, the attributes of other products. Uh, so we look at uh, all these uh, kinds of information. Um, again, we use deep learning graph representation to kind of merge these things together to find a good ranked list of relevant for that users. That's a short description. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. No, I, I think um, those are the kinds of things that we just take for granted, right? Because uh, in the example you used, add milk to my cart, um, yeah. milk can mean a lot of things. Uh, do I mean yes. almond milk? Do I mean uh, normal milk? Do Organic I mean- Organic milk, a different almond particular almond. brand, anything. Yes. Right. Yeah. So uh, people do all these things and everything is kind of what, uh, implicit. Um, I didn't mention what earlier when we were talking about the common sense reasoning. Uh, in that conference where we present the paper, there's another paper. They are also doing things similar. Uh, so example in that paper is, oh, the view is so pretty. Right? Uh, and then the expectation is the assistant is going to ask you, do you want me to turn the camera app on? Uh, so user may say things in a very implicit way, but hoping the smart, intelligent assistance is going to take the right action, figuring out that uh, transaction. I, uh, I look we do to need to use a lot of rich information to do this, like the um, milk example. I can have a collection of all of the milk, and then for every milk, I have the description there. Um, I can also find uh, similar customers to you, and then fares, uh, find some similar ingredients, similar shared um, common things between the products you have and the relevant and do this kind of uh, reason. I, I have to say, one of my favorite parts about having these conversations is getting a view into the, the future that you see, uh, right? Because as you work on your research, you know what is eventually possible, although it's not necessarily possible today. Yeah. You, have these, you have these big dreams, these big ideas that uh, that are in your head about how things should work and how they will go. Um, and oftentimes they're just patterned off of what we see with natural human interactions or, or whatever. Um, but that, that is one of my favorite parts about having these kinds of interviews is that I get to I get to see inside your head a little and understand um, just the, the nuance of being able to sit and see a beautiful mountain range. Uh, and just by saying something, you just imagine that your camera will turn on and record some of that for you or take a picture. Uh, I, I absolutely love that. Yeah, I think whether the product manager or those PMs can collect the more requests whether from the users and Alexa, and then we can do these uh, working backwards from the user's needs request, and then we'll see how we can close that gap and work out with the technology part. Yeah. So, so we've talked a lot about your career and certainly a lot of the work that you've done recently. Um, is, is there something that stands out to you as kind of your biggest accomplishment in your career so far? Oh, that's an easy question. That's a short answer. <laughs> uh -huh. I think whether like as a parent and the most, uh, um, what the, the thing you are proud of is probably some achievement from your children. I don't know if that's how you feel. Um, so looking back when my career, I think what uh, uh, the most uh, rewarding thing is seeing some achievements from the people I have mentored, like knowing so much even from former students, postdoc, or maybe people I mentor whether in the company. Um, yeah, there's no doubt about that. I still get messages or emails from people I have worked with or former students and they tell me, or oh, I get promoted, I just became associate professor, or oh, I'm invited to give a keynote talk in this conference. That's, I think that's the most rewarding moment. I, I would agree with you. I think that that's, that's often overlooked though. I think a lot of people view uh, being someone that offers mentoring uh, as as oh that's extra work or I don't I don't want to do that stuff but the yeah. the reward that you get on the other side seeing people successful because they took your guidance your advice um, uh, because it, that's a we often say at Amazon you know trying to find a way to scale through others and um, it's it's interesting to me to think about that perspective that if if you go off and do your work in uh, in a vacuum by yourself. Your, your capacity is limited. But if you spread yeah. that knowledge and spread that experience yeah. across a number of people that are coming up, now your work is not only taking place in front of you, but in front of dozens of other people as well. So I, that, that's a great yeah. question. Yeah. yeah, that will be a better world. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, all right, so I, I also noticed uh, in your bio that it lists the Air Force Young Investigator Program uh, and the NSF Career Award. I, 
Um, I'd love to know about this Air Force Young Investigator Program. This this sounds interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, so these um, defense agencies, including um, Air Force, Army, Navy, Department of Defense, they all have this Young Investigator Program, YIP, um, award. And the program is meant to support uh, people who are in their early career development. Typically, the rule is it's five years after you get your uh, PhD and then you are qualified for this uh, award. And the goal is to, of course, help these um, uh, early career development of these whatever, outstanding uh, uh, investigators or scientists. Uh, and they also tries to increase the opportunity for these uh, scientists that will recognize or understand the needs from these uh, agencies, the research problems they care about. Uh, of course, there's another fundamental um, objective to just support the basic research in all kinds of areas in science and the technology. Um, and I think every year, at least for uh, Air Force, typically 30 to 40-ish scientists um, are selected every year for this YAP uh, award. Um, so I got the award um, 2009, 2010, yeah, a long time ago. Um, but my funded research uh, from Air Force uh, was about emotion recognition in speech. Uh, so when we're saying things and I want to know whether you are happy, sad, or angry. And there is a notion in the community and you probably will agree with me. Uh, there is some universal aspect uh, even if you don't know the language, you probably can roughly tell this person is angry, sad, or happy. Uh, and there's also some culture specific part. So we want to look at this from both um, cross culture and also universal weather thing and see if we can build a, a cross lingual emotion recognition systems. Uh, so the first paper we did um, for that funded research uh, is looking at the cross lingual emotion recognition in both automatic systems as well as human perception. And we recruited the people who were native Chinese speakers and native English speakers. And we played uh, Chinese, English, and German different uh, um, speech with different emotions. And we were looking at how people perceive these emotional speech uh, in their native language and also in the language they don't know. Uh, yeah. And of course, we also did the automatic part and then we trained the system using one language and we evaluate the system using the other language. And of course, this all happened before the deep learning um, got so prevalent. Uh, it was using the old classification approach like support vector machines, those kinds of things. Yeah. But the general message is probably um, still applicable right now. Uh, if you look at all these automatic systems, they suffer quite a bit. If you train the system using one language and you evaluate the system on the other language, you see a lot of degradation. But if you look at a human perception, there's a little bit of um, degradation, but not a whole lot. We can still get some universal um, cues about the emotion. Um, I'm thinking another um, uh, finding not from us is between the visual cues and the speech, um, there's more universal ones from the video one. Like if you watch a movie or a video speaking in another language, I don't know what languages you speak of, but maybe what you imagine is Chinese. Uh, just looking at the characters with the facial expression and listening to their uh, speech, you probably can get the character is happy, yeah. angry. Um, but I think most of the information comes from um, the video one. Um, the speech, you probably can tell when people shout and there may be um, for um, sure. It, maybe a good indicator. Has there been any research done about, are, are there any specific languages or cultures that don't map well to that? Like is, we talk about like the sound of anger is pretty universal across languages, but are are there places or dialects or languages where that is not true? I don't know the answer to that like, <laughs> the, uh, okay. question. Yeah, I, I, um, it was just yeah based answer. on the literature we did back then, but those probably um, were all the languages that were widely studied in the research community. Sure. This is also related to the low resource language problem. Maybe there are things out there that we don't quite know. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't have a lot of information no, that, about those kinds clever. of languages. Yeah, that's that's a good it was question. A curiosity question. Yeah, um, definitely. 
I think that um, it would be it would be odd if we found like a small tribe someplace that uh, definitely their anger yeah. sounded like laughter or something. You know? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but probably unlikely. And honestly, as as our globe continues to get smaller and smaller, and we get exposed to more and more uh, other cultures, just right, through yeah. television, radio, yeah. internet, uh, I think that we will find more yeah, and more. It's very different. Uh -huh. as, as we and were. maybe what going back to that superpower, what well, <laughs> I right. had, if people can express the things in the right way to the audience, and then we will have no miscommunication at all, even though you are using a weird <laughs> original what, intentional language. All right. we, we are almost out of time. I have one more question for you uh, before we wrap up here. Uh, I know that a lot of the folks that are in our audience um, might still be in school uh, or are pursuing a lot of the careers that we've been talking about, some of their research and industries. Uh, and so I'd, I'd really be curious, do you have any advice for people that are looking for careers in speech or natural, natural language processing? Um, I sort of do. <laughs> I'm not good at giving what advice, but as you said, uh, since I have these years of experiences, I do have some tips. Uh, so first I want to say what if you are interested in all these, what a speech language, what a technology, you are in a very good time right now. And this is a very, well, this is a growing field and there are a lot of interesting problems out there and some challenges we mentioned uh, earlier. And you have data and you have what, um, com computing what the resources and there are also a lot of tools, um, open source stuff out there. So it's very easy to get into the field. But then once you start, that's what I meant. What I do have a few tips. So in terms of the technical part, um, I think it's good for everyone to build a very good foundation. So this is, requires the breadth and depth of your knowledge. Uh, and if we can use uh, the technology we talked about the water previously, so just take speech or language as an example. We were using something called a heater markup model, HMM for speech recognition. And then that technique was adopted in many other natural language problems in speech, rec not speech recognition, in machine translation, in part of speech tagging. Uh, another example is uh, this thing called the convolutional neural network. It was developed in computer vision uh, but then it was also adopted in natural language processing for uh, text classification to find uh, what a sentiment, uh, to find a topic of uh, different articles. Um, so these are just example. If you know more and you also get inspired from similar or other fields, uh, this requires quite some breadth of the knowledge. And then for the depth part, uh, you really need to have a good understanding for that particular problem you are working on. Uh, you don't want to just report, oh, I'm getting 10% um, better with accuracy than some previously published uh, papers or results. You need to ask yourself a few questions. Why, uh, what findings you are getting? Uh, what do the results mean? Uh, what are the contribution from different components? So this requires some deep understanding. And in Amazon, we have a, a leadership principle called dive deep. This is what every scientist or every uh, person who is working on these what scientific problems needs to have. Uh, yeah. And of course, the rest is all about the general uh, problem solving skill uh, in universities or maybe what in your lab setting. Uh, some people have already formulated the problem for you. You have a data set and you just need to develop some models uh, to Try to get a better performance but in real world you need to formulate that problem yourself maybe you need to collect your data you need to define your metric uh, so it requires a lot of these problem solving skill uh, and then what else is important soft skills collaborating with other people uh, having open-minded um, um, uh, have a good network all these things are extremely uh, important yeah. so i think yeah, I've I'll, I'll use it's yeah. funny how often we have to tell people, and I mean we, just in the global we, that working with and collaborating with people um, is something that you need to be good at. Um, yes. Because I see so many people that just want to live in their own box and do their own thing. Uh -huh. uh, and the, the growth mm -hmm. and the knowledge and the the, the big leaps in, in anything uh, came from people working together. Uh, my, mine goes off sometimes too, it's quite all right. Yeah, um, maybe that's why I mentioned what are those dogs or horses they are right? going to collaborate. That's the first what the reaction when you have a team and then well, yeah, you need to work uh, very well with the others. Agreed. Well, 
I heard uh, depth, I heard problem solving, and I heard collaboration. I think those are all positive strengths for anybody that's thinking about getting into both science or technology at all. Um, all right. Well, Yang, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Um, for all of you that are watching, if you want to see any of uh, the papers that have, we've been discussing or anything, you can go to amazon.science to check out uh, her research as well as everyone else's uh, in our Amazon Science organization there. Um, <clears throat> there's also uh, Interspeech 2021 page, um, and uh, you can find all of the research papers from this year's conference there. Um, I really, really appreciate uh, the fact that you're willing to take the time to share your knowledge and experience with all of us. Uh, it's, it goes a long way. And uh, based on the conversations I'm seeing in the chat, um, you know, you've, you've certainly inspired some people to take the next steps in what they're thinking about too. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Certainly. All right. I'm going to leave all of you with a short video uh, all about working in the Amazon Science Organization. Um, but thank you guys all for tuning in. This is the end of the stream and we will see you all again next time. My name is Ola Banji Shonibar. I am an applied scientist at Amazon. I work with the Pro Language Understanding Service and Response Team within Alexa Speech. My name is Aparna and I'm a senior applied scientist in the Alexa Speech Recognition Team. Currently, I'm working on building better experiences